Hey everybody, welcome to week two in microbiology. This week we are going to go through two PowerPoints, one on antimicrobial agents. So again, this should be review from micro one. And then the second one will be um, infections of special populations. So let's get started with the antimicrobial. I am just gonna put this into the slideshow format real quick. All right. So again, an antimicrobial agent is basically just anything that can inhibit or kill the infecting microorganism. So there's two terms that we commonly refer to, bactericidal and bacteriostatic. So bacteriostatic is those that do tend to inhibit the growth, whereas bactericidal actually will kill the target organisms. So again, any antibiotic or any antimicrobial agent should be at a sufficient concentration to make sure it's doing its job and it'll have some sort of interaction between that agent and the microbe. And that's how we generally classify the agent. So again, as going back to micro one, when we first discussed this, we had to memorize how each of the antibiotics targeted the organisms. And again, you guys will still need to know that information. All right, so that's the mode of action. Like we just said, how do they act upon the cell? What component are they disrupting? So the most common are gonna fit into one of the categories of cell wall, cell membrane, protein synthesis, DNA, or RNA synthesis tend to be the more common ones. So out of your textbook, there is a nice chart in that, that chapter, I think this is chapter 12, I wanna say. Um, I could be wrong on the chapter number right now, but um, basically these show you the overall major drugs and the categories that they fall into. So at the very top is the fluoroquinolones. You should definitely know that they are DNA synthesis inhibitors. So I would just quickly categorize them under DNA. It's easier. Um, if you look at beta-lactams, which are listed down toward the bottom, those are cell wall synthesis in inhibitors. Same with glycopeptides. Those are also cell wall. And again, knowing the examples of what falls into each of these groups. So in the beta-lactams, that's all your penicillin, cephalosporins, carbapenems. In the glycopeptides, vancomycin was a big one that we always discussed. And then special note on glycopeptides, they only target gram pauses. So it keeps going, so please be sure you look at this, know the mode of action, know some of the examples, and know um, what gram stain of organisms they're targeting. If they're targeting all, it's more like broad spectrum, or if it's gram pause, gram neg. So this just kind of gives you another picture format view, something different to look at. So here they have the cell walls um, listed underneath that. The cell membrane was the polymyxins and colistin B tended to target the cell membrane. Um, over here you see there's those fluoroquinolones under DNA. Rifampin was the only one I've ever made you guys learn for RNA. Rs go together. And then protein inhibitors. They can inhibit proteins by either 50S or 30S, but regardless, they're all protein inhibitors there. And then you've got some others that tend to inhibit like the folic acid pathway, trimethoprim, sulfonamides were both of those. So if you like this kind of picture format, maybe that's helpful. All right, so going actually through it, inhibitors of cell wall synthesis, again, beta-lactam is such a big group of antibiotics. Um, definitely should know this group. And they're called the beta-lactams because they have that beta-lactam ring. And that ring will bind to the penicillin binding proteins in that cell wall. And that's how they target the organism. So again, it is the biggest group of antibiotics, penicillin, cephalosporins, carbapenems, all great examples of beta-lactam. Now, there are organisms that have become resistant to beta-lactams. And they do that because they form the enzyme beta-lactamase. And that enzyme will bind and hydrolyze the drug so that it does not work on it anymore. So that's just always something to keep in mind there. So this is showing that beta-lactam ring truly in a ring shape or, well, it's kind of square, but you get the idea. Uh, and then when that addition of that enzyme comes in, see the, how they make it so it's incomplete? Not going to work. Let's simplify chemistry down to those words. All right. Basically, um, again, there's going to be spectrum of activity. If I talk about narrow spectrum, it means it's only going to work on one type of organism. For the example, glycopeptides. Remember, glycopeptides are part of the cell wall synthesis. They only do gram pauses because they're too big to fit through. Um, 
And then broad spectrum will work on a variety. So like the penicillins, the beta lactams were broad spectrum. All right, so again, there's that glycopeptide example, vancomycin, targeting gram positive. And then inhibiting cell membrane was just the lipopeptides and polymyxin, a great example of a polymyxin, again, was colistin. These tend to target gram negatives. Uh, proteins, lots and lots fall under this. This is where the majority of your antibiotics reside, is under protein synthesis. Aminoglycosides, gentamicin is always a great example there, and so on, so you can read through those. And then again, proteins can be um, defined whether they're 30S or 50S. So here I've got them separated. This is kind of extra information. You guys didn't have this as much in Micro 1, but we're, we'll add to your Micro 1 knowledge and add this in there. And again, DNA is the fluoroquinolones, metronidazole, and rifampin was RNA, and then some of the others, sulfonamides, so trimethoprim, time to be folic acid. So again, antibiotics are not exciting. There's a lot of memorizing. I don't really have any tips, tricks here. It's just memorizing. If I did have any, I, you know I'd offer them up. <laughs> but it's a lot of memorizing. Um, some other terms, resistance. You can have intrinsic resistant, which is something found in the bacteria naturally or acquired. Say they got it from exchanging DNA um, outside in the environment, and they picked up resistance that way. They also have biologic and clinical resistance. I don't test on these on the quiz, so you don't have to worry about these as much. And biofilms at the bottom here. We are going to have a whole chapter on biofilms, so I'm not going to really talk about that right now because later on we're going to get into that. So again, the biggest part of this is knowing a couple of the key terms at the beginning, which was bacteriostatic, bactericidal, knowing all the different categories of drugs and their mode of action and their spectrum of activity and some examples that reside in each. That should pretty much get you through for what you need on this chapter. All right, let's go to our other PowerPoint, which is infections in special populations. So here are the basic four stages of microbial to human interaction. So you have your physical encounter that occurs between the host and microbe. The microbe colonizes and then gets inside, whether it's through a wound or food or whatever it might be. But there's entry, invasion, and dissemination, and then the outcome would be the disease or the infection that it can cause. So again, you have your immune system. You have three parts to your immune system, as we should all well know by now. So your first is your skin and mucous membranes. Um, your innate immune system is next, that's kind of your natural immune system, that's more phagocytic cells coming into place, so neutrophils, macrophages are really big here and gobbling up what they can, complement, all those complement proteins that act together to destroy something at the end, all that's part of the natural. And then the acquired or specific immune system is where you finally make antibodies directly to target that foreign antigen. So anybody that we consider immunocompromised means that that whole immune system that we just discussed doesn't work that great. Um, it could be that they have other diseases occurring like leukemias, HIV, they're a burn patient. Um, any of that will compromise their immune system. And so whenever that happens, these people are much more adept at picking up infections, unfortunately, and they're much more serious to them than they are to people that immune system is healthy. So it discusses here patients with serious diseases who are at high risk for even just opportunistic infections, those infections that we wouldn't necessarily pick up otherwise. So people that are considered immunocompromised typically have maybe a decreased leukocyte number, so decreased white counts. Um, again, then you see leukemia, aplastic anemia, which is bone marrow failure. They have decreased moral cell media immune function. So what if they're decreased in their B cells and can't make antibodies? Or they're decreased in their T cells, which is what happens in HIV, things like that. If they have their spleen removed, um, that will help bring their immune system down. So anything of the sort will result in what we call an immunocompromised situation. So again, here's a list of things that will cause immunosuppression. Um, so things that are happening to them that suppress their cells that they have. Chemotherapy, radiation therapy, all these things wipe out the cells as in general. 
All right, so let's get into healthcare associated infection specifically. So ventilator associated pneumonia is a nosocomial pneumonia, meaning it occurs in the hospital, it's hospital acquired. A lot of times these patients are in ICU, they're placed on ventilators to help them breathe and if there is something stuck on that ventilator, like if there's an organism on there and it gets into them, that's when it can cause the pneumonia. So you will get a fever, just like with any pneumonia, you get fever, high white counts, you know, it's indicating an active infection. Organisms that tend to really cause this, strep pneumo, haemophilus influenzae, staph aureus, pseudomonas, originosa, Klebsiella, enterobacter, burkholderia sapacea. I mean, the list, when you look at that, if you can hopefully remember most of these organisms from micro one, all of these caused respiratory illnesses. Every single one of these had something to do with respiratory to begin with. So it shouldn't be a surprise that they're here listed with the ventilator-associated pneumonia. Probably some of the biggest um, cost comes with trying to clear somebody's pneumonia out with these ventilator-associated. And when we get into the biofilm factor, we'll talk about ventilator-associated pneumonia. Biofilms, because they are like a slime layer on the equipment and they're hard to get off, that's how they can go and cause pneumonia. Um, so they're huge causes here. Malignancy, so anytime somebody has a malignancy like leukemia, things like that, they're getting chemotherapy as treatment, you wipe out your cell population. So as a result, you don't have many neutrophils and they're not doing so great, you know, because they're being killed off. So you're gonna be prone to infection and malignancy because of the lack of phagocytic cells. So infections here, um, a lot of times are very severe infections when you don't have neutrophils around. You got pneumonia and septicemia. Septicemia causes huge mortality rate for cancer patients. So if they pick up something like a septicemia, it's, it's a really poor prognosis. Um, pneumonia is a big one, skin infections, meningitis. So you see big, big diseases that go along with somebody who has malignancy and if they get something. Fungal agents can also occur here. Um, so aspergillus, mucor, those are typically opportunistic fungal agents, but you're gonna see the, they'll take out advantage if they can. Candidiasis, which is a yeast infection, pneumocystis urovecchii, um, or pneumocystis carinii. Any of these can come with malignancies. Typically with fungus, I think I said this, in the, if I didn't say this in my ecology chapter, I thought I did, is usually people who pick up fungal are usually immunosuppressed. Anytime I hear somebody in a hospital with fungal pneumonia, I know right away that their immune system is down. It's really tough to get a fungal pneumonia because we're exposed to things like fungus all the time. So when they do pick it up, typically they're already immunocompromised patient. All right, other infections that will go with malignancy, different viruses and parasites. You have herpes. Um, you have Toxoplasma gondii, strongyloides, so again, all found here with malignancy. And then Hodgkin's. So patients specifically with Hodgkin's disease are susceptible to different types of parasites. I know these first two are more bacteria, but they can act like intracellular parasites at times. They're harder to get rid of. So tuberculosis, listeria. And then you do have a yeast here, Cryptococcus neoformans. And the reason that these people with Hodgkin's disease are picking up is because of impaired cell-mediated immunity. So their T cells are not functioning very well in Hodgkin's. Same with AIDS patients. AIDS specifically, tar HIV, I should say the virus, specifically targets the T helper cells, CD4 T helpers, which decreases the volume of them, which makes it easier, again, to pick up infections. Complement, so complement is an entire system as part of our natural immune system. And if you're missing any of the steps, it can cause you to have a complement deficiency, which again, makes you more prone to infection. One of the biggest ones is if you're missing C3. So if you have learned complement, this will make more sense to you. If you haven't, just hang in there with me. Um, C3, complement three, is the biggest step probably in complement. It's the one that we have the most of. So if you're deficient in this, this is the one that you really pick up a sepsis. Um, it's, it's a big step to be missing within those pathways. Let's just put it that way. So if you are deficient in that, you are going to be more prone to sepsis with staph aureus 
or with strep pyogenes, two big pathogens there. C5 through 9, if you're missing, this is the end part of complement. That's what actually destroys the organism at the very end to help protect us. So if you are missing this step or somewhere in this step, again, you're going to be prone to bacteremias. Neisserias really love to be part of causing an issue here. And then there's other pathways of complement. There's another pathway of complement called the alternate. I'm not going to worry that much about that. I would definitely make note of the C3 deficiency if I were you off of this slide. Burns, burn patients, um, immune system is shot, their normal skin flora is destroyed, so it's really easy to get past that first step. Um, you know, a lot of things have been killed or not working very well after a burn incident. So their immune defense mechanisms are suppressed in general. So infection is the major cause of why they may pass. And pneumonia is probably the number one infection seen with burn patients. So Pseudomonas aeruginosa is a huge lung infection causer. That's the one that really goes with cystic fibrosis patients as well. Um, it's Pseudomonas aeruginosa and Burkholderia sapacea tend to infect lungs, especially if they're like cystic fibrosis or just anybody that's immunocompromised here, they would be also big if that pneumonia possibility here. Organ transplant. Um, so first four weeks, you might have some just different post-op bacterial infections come rise. One to six months after, there's some guys listed here that tend to really go along with causing issues. post splenectomy, sepsis is always a big one, and it's especially those that already have a capsule. So anything that is encapsulated bacterial are the ones that really cause the infection. So strep pneumo, haemophilus influenzae, Neisseria meningitidis are the three to death definitely remember for probably causing sepsis in a post patient. Cystic fibrosis, as I mentioned earlier, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Burkholderia sapacea are the two big ones that cause lung infections in cystic fibrosis patients. Diabetic patients, um, the big thing here is especially yeast infections. Because in diabetes you have increased sugar in your blood, that's the problem with diabetes, candida yeast thrive off that sugar. Oh my gosh, they love it so much. So they're really prone to candida yeast infections with diabetes. There's other things that go along with it, but candida is a big one. And then age. Anytime you get older, your immune system is lessening as you get older, or if you're a brand new baby, you don't have much of an immune system either. But these are when you're going to have increase in malignancies, increase in probably procedures that you might be getting due to other diseases or things that are coming up. So, and then again, like we said, fetus um, on this page, you know, you don't really form antibodies until about six months of age. So anything under six months doesn't is considered immunosuppressed. So E. coli UTIs, um, if you're pregnant, vaginal yeast infections um, all tend to be common. And then again, we know we've talked about neonatal meningitis with strep B, A. glactiae, strep A. glactiae, and listeria monocytogenes. But there's lots of other things that can be passed congenitally to the baby. So, and they're kind of listed here. All right, it's kind of a hodgepodge chapter. I know it gets a bit confusing. I would just remember, I mean, the whole chapter is based on, let's talk about immunosuppression and different organisms that tend to occur with different conditions. So I would just kind of go through and know like any organisms we listed out like ventilator associated pneumonia. Those are all pneumonia-like ill organisms anyway. Um, the malignancy, the Hodgkin's one right there. Um, the C3 deficiency, burns, organ transplants, post splenectomy, those three. The cystic fibrosis, those two. Diabetes with candida. So, you know, just kind of whittle it down and you should be just fine. Again, it's just, you know, we already know these organisms. It's just remembering them and knowing what they can be linked to in the immunocompromised patients. All right, so that is it for this week. We will meet together to get for lab. And if you have any questions, as always, please feel free to reach out to me. Thanks so much.